A very good evening to all our viewers out there and a very warm welcome to Newsline Prime, of course, coming to you live and direct from the News First studios here in Colombo. Your usual host, Farah Shaukut Ali, is out for the day. I'm Charlene Benedict and I will be sitting in for him today. Uh, the elections is uh, the hotly discussed topic right now here in Sri Lanka. Who will be the candidates coming for the presidential election? Is it going to be a presidential election or a provincial council election that comes first? All these questions still have to be answered. Responsible authorities still have not come forward with these answers. But uh, to discuss about these and many other matters, today in our studios we've got uh, Mr. Marlin the Seniviratna, he's a senior journalist, civil activist, and a political commentator. Very good evening, Marlin Dharan. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Uh, Marlin Seniviratna, like I was speaking about before, the elections are coming up. This uh, time, the elections seem to be more hotly contested than even the 2015 presidential elections, simply because of the fact that, to date, we do not even know the names of the candidates who will be representing the respective parties or coming up as independent candidates for the presidential election. Sharna, when you were making those introductory comments, uh, I recall the 1988 uh, presidential election. The beginning of that year, uh, mm -hmm. the SLFP put forward uh, Sirima Bandar Naik, uh, and Vijay Kumar Tunga was the candidate of the United Left uh, Alliance, United uh, Socialist Alliance. Right. And everyone knew that uh, Rana Singh Premadas would be the UNP candidate. Mm -hmm. At that time, uh, people knew when elections were going to be held. So mm -hmm. when you do know when the election roughly, okay, the end of this year, mm -hmm. then uh, you could parties uh, contesting will uh, think about campaigns, they will think about candidates. But here we have a country where we have had eight out of the nine provincial councils are now defunct. They are not right. operating. Uh, they have not held elections. We had the... We don't have... We don't We don't have an elections culture anymore. Exactly. They have done away with it and they call it Hapa and, uh, ironically. <laughs> right, but see, we had the, the, the local government elections were postponed. Hmm. and held very late and now they are talking whether to have a general election or a presidential election or a or referendum or, or a, a provincial referendum. council election as well all these all three of are them are on the table so you can't really blame the political parties for not being why should they show their hand on one on the one hand on the other hand if they're so confident about winning hmm. they can say well this is our man who are you going to put forward but uh, you know, to be fair, the United National Party said they are going to announce their candidate on the 1st of May. Mm. Then we had the Easter Sunday attacks and then everyone forgot about uh, all that. Then the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, the Pohotu mm. party as we call them, they have announced that they will announce the candidate <laughs> on the, I think, the 15th of The, uh, the 11th of August. The, uh, I heard, but, uh, well, soon. Okay. They're announcing about the announcement. The Janata Vimukti Paramuna is silent. Hmm. Aren't they going to contest this time? Aren't they going to support anyone? We really don't know. So if these political parties don't believe that they are loyalists and the people whose votes they will solicit at some point, if they're not interested in um, telling us, look, if they want to keep us in the dark, um, how can we trust them uh, to represent us at any level, be it local government elections, provincial, uh, in parliament or in the president's uh, the presidential secretariat? Hmm. That is the situation. It's an unfortunate situation. It does not say much about how, what a thriving, democracy. Uh, healthy democracy we are. Uh, so also speaking about uh, when, when a presidential candidate comes up, they present policies. Do you believe that uh, the political parties in Sri Lanka have any policies remaining? Well, uh, Mangala Samarvira, our Minister of Media and uh, finance. finance, he said famously, manifestos are there only for until the election is over. <laughs> <laughs> Some people in Colombo think he's like, uh, you know, God, quote unquote, gift uh, to democracy and good governance and all this. But, uh, you know, that, uh, sadly, hmm. is not something that no, he actually articulated it. Okay. But it is not something he alone believes. It's a widely held uh, conviction by all politicians hmm. that manifestos are just a piece of paper. And then 
you talk on the other side of the of this uh, of the platform, you get the people, the mm -hmm. voters. Do they really care Consider. about manifest? We have more than elect people. We have uh, uh, sent people out of power. <laughs> if a vote is seen as an instrument to remove people from power, mm -hmm. then manifestos don't have any anything to do with it. Because those who are going, they can take their manifestos and go home. Right. And we don't care who comes in because our main purpose has been to throw people out of power. Mm -hmm. We saw that in nineteen uh, in two thousand and fifteen. Mm -hmm. So. We hold people uh, uh, accountable. We say, okay, this is what you said in their manifesto, and they have to answer to that. Mm. But uh, to be honest, uh, what was the single most compelling factor for people to vote for Maitri Pal Sirisen? If you look back, you know, I haven't done a, an opinion poll, but one can make an educated guess get the Rajapaksas out. So if the compelling factor in 2019 election year is get the Yahapal, quote unquote, out, what of the manifestos of the successor to Maitri Pala Sirisen or the successor to the successor to the Yahapalna government? Uh, falling in line with what you just said uh, brings back to memory a statement made by uh, MP Dallas Alhaperuma. He said that uh, the Pohotua party will be launching the 100 days program. And I was wondering at the back of my head if they're speaking about another 100 days program like the government of uh, good governance first uh, announced their 100 days program. But it was not a program like that. It was the 100 days program to remove the incumbent government from power. Yeah, they so have, I think that validates your statement pretty well. We have had lots of 100 uh, days uh, government and then I remember Dr. Harsha Disilo, my good friend, hmm. um, whom I've known since I was four years old, uh, during the time the Rajapaksas were in power, hmm. uh, almost every three months he would say the economy is going to collapse. Right. But nothing happened. We, mm. we went into debt, but it, economy didn't collapse. And not that everything is now hunky dory right <laughs> now, right? Uh, and that those were supposed to be the wizards of uh, economic management and all that. Mm. Uh, so, the 100 days program also got a bad name because of the 100 days uh, promise of the Yahapalana uh, regime, mm. uh, the, the Mantri Palasi Risena candidacy. Mm. Uh, certain things happened, very little happened. Now, 100 days. How many hundred four and a half days, years? Uh, four and a half years. We into the line. Make a, a, a quick calculation that's about 1,400 uh, plus days. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, was the executive presidency abolished? Right. We got the Right to Information Act. We got the 19th Amendment, which is which is obviously flawed. Hmm. Uh, we have. Uh, Adding to that, Dr. Jayampati Vikram Ratna did admit to the general public that it was flawed and he was one of the p people who spearheaded the drafting of that. Yeah, and they ch they, but they did not say that at that point, they were like very celebratory about, about it and applauding it. We did this. But uh, the 19th Amendment is flawed, the Constitutional Council and independent um, uh, institutions, the commissions mm. that came out of the 19th Amendment, uh, simply on account of the horrendously worded uh, wordings regarding the composition of the Constitutional Council, which gave back power to politicians. And then you have, uh, you have uh, friends and families in the, in the indep independent uh, commissions. commissions. Right. And uh, you know, who's urgent, whom are they accountable to? They're not accountable. It has, they have operated in such a way that we prefer the president or someone whom we can actually uh, hold accountable and, and, and uh, remove from power to be accountable, to appoint these people because they are accountable to us. Mm. These people, who are they? Who are they? What are they doing here? They have no mandate from They the have absolutely no mandate and they are not, uh, they are not representing my interests. I don't know whose interests they represent, all these people. They have given uh, promotions to judges, you know, high court to appease court to like this, how does that happen? What is the, I mean, what is the criteria? Criteria, you know, I don't, aren't they interested in putting the system right? Right? We have they appointed the IGP, and then they have the fighting. They are fighting with the president over appointment. Anyway, so hundred days program, what did it? How much of it was done? Right? So when Dallas Salah talks about hundred days program, I, I would 
I didn't hear. Oh, no, this was not. This was not for the. This was not for the progress of the country or after they form a government. Yeah, but this was a hundred days program to remove, remove this government from power. So this has actually come into effect before uh, the elections. Yeah, but well, I, I suppose all those in opposition would like to uh, you know, remove those in power because they they obviously don't do politics because they believe they are, they can be better uh, a better regime or they deserve to be in power. They have uh, the interest. They deserve the perks and privileges. Yeah, that too, and also that uh, they they represent the majority voice, uh, the voice of the majority of the people, uh, and so you make that kind of uh, very aggressive, uh, confident uh, statement. I suppose that is politics, but hundred days is hundred days, and uh, you know you can talk about how many hours and how many weeks, <laughs> but what happens at the end of the day, uh, you know, as you know. It, why are we interested in throwing this one out and getting that one in, then getting that one out and getting it in? My, my contention, I, have, I said this before, is that the person who worked the hardest to bring Maitri Parasirisen uh, to power was Mahindraj Baksa. He was not planning to do so, but his actions and you know, his crimes of uh, omission and commission paved the way for this uh, president to mm -hmm. come to power. And now they're returning the favor. Right, right. So it's it's a continuing It's a vicious cycle that just keeps on continuing. Well, I, vicious cycle. I mean, there's nothing out, you can get out of it. But I, 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 I want to be a, an optimist, and I believe that the people of this country deserve better. And I believe that uh, Parliament is not the avenue to get things done and get things right. That does not mean I'm, I'm all for anarchy. If this is what we have, if this is the democracy, uh, if this <laughs> is what we are getting and the democracy, I'm for anarchy. I have no issue about it, right? <laughs> but even this side of violent, bloody revolution, I still believe that uh, civil society, not those who wear that, say, I'm, I'm a representative of civil society, those uh, 100 NGOs which say uh, 100 organizations and they can't bring 90 people for a demonstration, not that kind of, uh, you know, civil clowns. Mm -hmm. But people who have a sense of uh, what this country is, where it should be going, how we should uh, treat each other, and how we can be a community uh, where, where there is solidarity and, and so on. There are people who do that. They are not mm. making a big noise. They are not getting my money from somewhere to say this at that point and so on. But there are people like that and I believe that they can, they will quietly organize in the logic of organization that they understand but which civil society do not. <laughs> and that is where I think we can place our hope, the future. So the current political situation in the country is of course compounded and complicated uh, with the intervention of foreign powers. Of course those countries are working for their benefit and they see an opportunity, they are bound to come and take it. How far has this complicated the situation here? Uh, it's, it's just one of the biggest tragedies is that we have had leaders who lack vision, who don't have ideas, and most tragically, don't have faith in in our people. Right. So when you don't have answers and you don't want to look for answers from uh, the people who elect you, hmm. you go to the guy who says, "I have the answers." Right. But it comes at a cost. Uh, at a cost, right? So you have. And sometimes it's not just money; it's your <laughs> freedom. It's your freedom. I mean, we know what uh, the Western powers did to the Chagosians. Hmm. Right. We are not too far from where, where, they, that, where they were, right? <coughs> not geographically, hmm. but politically. Yes. We are, we are in, so, but why should we? May, maybe we, it's better for us to be poor, poorer, hmm. uh, according to the IMF definition of poverty. Hmm. I don't think we are poor in, in that way. Uh, better for us to be poor even, poor even in that sense and not have Americans, Chinese, Indians fighting over what part of the country, what part of the economy they should control. And then we have people making idiotic statements that uh, India was behind the uh, <laughs> Easter Sunday attack. <laughs> India has 160 million uh, Muslims. They have a problem of that. They don't want to, you know, feed that at this end. India may have, I mean, I don't believe any country is a friend. They have mm. interests, right? But uh, and India has a bad history uh, with respect to Sri Lanka and they'll it. But that's all in the past. We can mm. say we can move on. But why should we depend on any country 
to write a foreign policy, agricultural policy, or whatnot, or change the constitution as some people want to. Sri Lanka is inherently known to have had a non-aligned policy even during the massive world wars. We were we followed a non-aligned policy. If that all died after, uh, you know, by the end of the 80s and the collapse of the Soviet Union and became you know, this bipolar, this whole business of two power centers. When, mm. But now you do have the Asian uh, economies, Japan, uh, China and India, and you have the failing, fading West. Right. Uh, I don't know how that will play out. But the online movement uh, had its day hmm. and it's gone, right? But maybe we need a new world order where we think of uh, countries in a different kind of way and uh, think of multilateral agreements in a different kind of way. We have the United Nations where it's supposed to be one vote, one nation, one vote, mm -hmm. right? But if you uh, have money and you tell the country, uh, the representative of Sri Lanka, and supposing you are an America, American or say Germany or whatever, say, you know, brother, how about, would you like a bridge or a, or a hospital? Hmm. All right, uh, I would like a bridge. Mm -hmm. How about voting for us, voting with us on this particular resolution? Right. So it's um, to me the we buy and sell votes. Uh, so it's not a flat, uh, even playing field. Hmm. And in that uh, political structure, we are tiny players, and therefore our challenges are that much greater. Hmm. And we have to exercise a lot of diplomacy. Uh, and be on the on the on the ball all the time. We can't drop our guard. But unfortunately, we have foreign ministers, governments, prime ministers who will say, "Before you ask to raise your hand, they will raise." I'm ready. <laughs> what is your proposal? Just let me. Just tell me. I'm ready. No, that is statesmanship. That is representing me. That is servility of the worst order. It's, uh, in this, under this government in particular, it's a uh, horrendous, tragic, and very sad uh, expression of a very uh, colonial, post-colonial servile mentality. Also, getting back uh, from the international arena, back to a little bit of the local scene, uh, one thing that I have noticed is that None of these political parties like to even speak about the presidential candidate. They don't even like the mention of it, especially at media briefings. When journalists bring this up, they're, they're like, we'll announce it later. We haven't conducted discussions on it, or we will find a candidate that loves the country, you know, all that kind of jargon going on. Generous uh, kind of interpretation is they really don't know, right? Now, if the United National Party in 1989, 1994, in the year 2000 and 2005, hmm. both these major political parties were very clear about who's going to contest. Hmm. Uh, the SLFP led UPFA had a bit of a problem hmm. uh, uh, because they were not, uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa's name was one of a few, hmm. right? But the United National Party, Rani Lukram Singh. Uh, because of the assassination of Rani Singh Premadas in 1994, there was, and, and Gam Sanak and all these people leaving and coming back, there was that thing there. But mm. more or less, they knew what they were doing. Come 2010, <laughs> they're looking for a common candidate. Come 2015, they're looking for another common, common candidate. candidate. One would believe that the United National Party has had a long period of time to think about who their candidate is. They have not put forward a, a party a member as a candidate in 14 years, right? Mm. They haven't had a president in 25 <laughs> years. Uh, they have had to pick someone from another party. They had to pick someone from outside. Sarat Pan said, my three policies. Uh, but I, my gut feeling is if Rani Vikram Singh believes that he can win, he will contest. If he doesn't, he'll have to have a fall guy, right? Right. Uh, why should he suffer uh, another defeat, defeat? Another defeat at this stage of his life. Mm. I'm not counting out uh, Ryan Vikramasinghe as a possible winner at some point, but uh, right now he's in a very bad. He's batting on a very bad wicket. I, I, I mean, in jest, of course. I say that uh, at this point, when you read the, when you read the temper of the electorate to really travel around you, you see, especially mm. if you're out of Colombo 7, you see a lot of things. Right. Uh, we are talking about the World, the World Cup is on right now, cricket, <laughs> and if uh, 
for me, Maitri Pal Sirisen and the SLFP are like, a bit like the Afghanistan. They make a bit of noise for their house. United National Party and Ranil Vikramasinghe are a bit like South Africa. Because uh, they were in the mix of content. But they lose everything. No, no, but now they're eliminated. Right. right. Someone asked then, what about the Pohotu and their way things are? Hmm. The way they have been campaigning for the Pohot to a candidate hmm. by making themselves uh, kind of illegitimate. Okay. Whoever wins the World Cup hmm. is the Pohot to a candidate <laughs> and the Pohot to, right? Right. Then someone asked me, what is Sri Lanka? Hmm. Sri Lanka is a bit like JVP. They can mess things up. They can make someone else win. They can never win. I mean, they are not in a position to win. It would be shocking if the JVP won. Right. So, uh, that is my reading of where we are in terms of candidates. But I believe, having said that, within the next uh, four or five weeks, hmm. we will have all these parties with candidates unless they go for a general election all of a sudden. But I doubt that. Right. So, speaking about uh, the next president of this country, one thing that people must understand is the fact that the president is going to have a number of reduced powers. Uh, a, a lot of the powers of the president, or a, a certain amount of the powers of the president, uh, were curtailed through the 19th constitutional amendment. Uh, do you think that uh, the next president will be as strong as this president? Or, or already we can see the 19th amendment causing many problems to the incumbent president. It, 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 as far it, it, as one thing we have to understand about constitutions is that they are not cast in stone. They can change. Uh, Jaja, but should they? Well, we, we make things to the best of our knowledge, but right. if we are wrong, right? So that uh, amendment... Uh, uh, but what we can see in the recent past is that uh, the constitution, the, the, the most supreme law of the country, is being manipulated to serve the needs and wants of well, just how, a few. How many amendments have we had? We have had 19 amendments, right? of which except for the 17th hmm. and the 19th. Hmm. Uh, the 19th is a mess for other reasons. Uh, and even the 19th, except for the 17th, almost all, all of them were partisan. They were in favor of the ruling party or coalition. Right. Even the 19th was like that. Right. Right? So, when you talk about the next presidential candidate, next president, and what kind of power, no, do you think that anyone would want to be a, a, lame, a, a president who has no powers? Why spend so much money and effort to become a president who has no power? But I think that you judge the power of the president or anyone by who, uh, who has the most amount of power in the country the person who with the, with the little with, uh, with the least amount of effort can uh, change things the most hmm. right this that is my three power citizen some people exercise it some people don't yes some powers have been curtailed but imagine a situation where there's a UNP president and a UNP majority in parliament, say close to a two-thirds majority. Mm. It's anyway a situation where you can pull in some, pull in some people and mm. get their two-thirds, which J.R. Javadan thought would never happen, but Mahindra Rajapaksa proved right. can happen, right? How powerful would that president be? He has the party, he has the legislation on his side. He is the executive. But then also according to the 19th Amendment, you can't cross over parties. You can change the constitution if you have the uh, two-thirds majority, and provided that remove that provision from. Yeah, when he's talking, about Sirsen is talking about the 18th Amendment should be abolished, and I, it was abolished. Hmm. But and 18th and the 19th should go. Whether should we should go back to the pre-18th Amendment situation, I don't know. I mean, we still have the promised 20th Amendment of electoral reform hmm. that's gathering dust, <laughs> right? We want to get rid of the PR system, which is so, which makes for so much violence and which eliminates, which disqualifies ordinary people. You and I cannot contest. We just don't have the bucks and we don't have the gangs. Okay. Uh, so, a lot of things need to be done. But uh, the 19th Amendment is uh, not going to be there forever. We, mm -hmm. we don't have to assume that. I think it it's should a be. Given. Uh -huh, yeah, we, we have to amend the 19th Amendment so that we don't have to go to the Supreme Court each time someone makes a decision, right? Mm. How, how ridiculous is that? But then, which is why constitutional uh, reform, amendments should be robust uh, 
uh, mechanisms that mm. you can't just uh, someone can you, you can't leave it vague they left it vague they left the dissolution of parliament vague Fake. the powers to dissolve so speaking about parliament <coughs> parliament is the place where the general public of this country is represented it it is the most sovereign body in the country but speaking of representation one thing that happened today is that uh, responsible ministers of the government were not present in parliament uh, when the emergency regulation uh, extension uh, was being proposed in Parliament. And this was the same the last time that emergency regulations were extended in Parliament as well. I believe they barely made quorum with about 28 uh, MPs present in Parliament at the time, or just a little bit over that. Uh, well, uh, I don't know why they did not come, and I, I don't want to assume. But uh, the, Actually, the State Minister of uh, Defence, Ron Vijayawardena, did arrive in Parliament, but that was halfway through the speech of uh, uh, opposition MP Andrukumar Desanayake, the leader of the JVP, and uh, uh, during his, uh, his uh, complete opposition against the government ministers not being present mm. in Parliament, it was during that speech that uh, the State Minister of Defence entered Parliament. Yeah, I don't know what his reasons were for being uh, late, but one would uh, expect such an important vote, and such mm. an important matter, those uh, whose subjects these things are ought to have been there and I mean I, I didn't know the viewers should know that uh, he told me just before we started that the quorum is 20 right yes I didn't know that you know we learned something every yeah. day <laughs> 20 is less than 10 percent and we elect people like bad people right? <laughs> but we expect them to represent us if we have as a nation elected 224 plus a speaker, 225 people to parliament, and only 20 are there. Only 20, if 20 are there, if are, required to, are be there. required to be there. And 205 are missing. Where is the voice of all those people that's supposed to be heard through the mouths of these 205 people? I think that's a travesty of justice. I can understand, you know, on some days there being 100, 105 instead mm. of 125. But uh, if that is the case, let's do away with it. Let's do away with it, you know. Let's have some other form of government. We don't need these people. One, they're corrupt. Two, they're not there. Uh, and let's not forget that it takes, uh, it costs millions and millions of taxpayers' rupees for parliament to just convene on one single occasion, despite the MPs being present in parliament. Yeah, I mean, just flip it a little and say if we can get uh, uh, each time for each time parliament meets, we, uh, we forget that. We pick 225 random people, mm -hmm. distribute that money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Read every time in a particular district, you go from district. You, it's like we don't have to buy lottery tickets anymore. <laughs> I mean, it'll be more productive than that. Of course, we'll be happier. We'll be happier. You know, we'll feel that we are being represented. <laughs> we're least. getting some benefit. Malad, we're in the final few minutes of this show for today. One thing that uh, always people speak about are the problems that people face in this country. Now, with an election coming up, what are the options that Sri Lankan people have? What are the options on the table, actually? I, I think that uh, I think the Elections Commission has talked about uh, introducing that none of the above uh, options. That was a, that was a proposal put <coughs> forward by certain uh, civil society. But activists. I think that's a good thing because that will show how representative people are, whether we actually believe in this system. Or that's the first thing. But I, I think that now uh, this is our default option. Parliament is our default option, hmm. right? When that should not be the case. Uh, as I said, we, we vote people out of power. We, we don't have people to vote into power. Right. Uh, we, we have to think about uh, conducting our lives, thinking of organization, association and solidarity outside the uh, definitions, the language, the uh, lexicon that the politicians have given us. Right. Accountability, transparency, good governance, whatever you want to call it, hmm. these are lies, right? Why should we buy into these lies? Continue to, you know, uh, let's think of a different kind of language, let's think. Of, uh, as uh, metaphors for a different kind of practice where we have a voice and we are proud of it and it has some worth 
this system has devalued us, debased us, degraded us, humiliates and insults us every single moment. And there you have it. Uh, you heard it from uh, Malinda Senuratna, a civil activist and a political commentator. It's the general public at the end of the day who really has the power to change the fate of this country, uh, not a president of this country, not the parliament of this country, and certainly not uh, the politicians of this country. Thank you very much for joining us on Newsline. Until we meet next time, take care and God bless.